Now, <clears throat> this uh, information technology rules, which were uh, notified on uh, 25th of uh, February uh, in a press conference of uh, two major ministries, Ministry of Information Technology, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad and uh, Mr. Javdekar from the INB, was actually a very significant event um, for two reasons. One, this intermediary guideline was um, pending uh, since around December 2018. Uh, somehow the moment uh, the uh, amendment was introduced, we all know that we are talking of a guideline which comes under section 79, which has been in existence for 20 years now with uh, some changes which were made in 2008. The original section 79 was there uh, in the ITA 2000. Then in 2008, uh, when the amendment was made, some uh, changes were made. The rules on those modified section 79 came in uh, April 2011. Subsequently, it was also uh, discussed in the Shreya single case in Supreme Court, which upheld the particular section. And that has been prevailing there, there for quite a long time. So it is not something new. But in December 2018, the government tried to release a draft guideline. Basically, at that time, the concern of the government was the use of um, WhatsApp for um, spreading messages which uh, could lead to um, social unrest. We know that it has happened a number of times and people in Bangalore particularly are aware that the last uh, uh, riots which uh, happened uh, in Bangalore was triggered by the use of uh, WhatsApp. So for a long time, the government of India has been in discussion with WhatsApp about uh, whether they can assist the government in identifying the origin of a message when it is forwarded. Subsequently, of course, WhatsApp have been telling that technically it is not uh, possible or not easy. They only agreed to actually put restrictions on the number of forwards uh, uh, to five. Beyond that, they did not do anything uh, to change their uh, system. So when this 2018 version was, um, draft version was released, there was a big uh, opposition from the tech uh, companies saying that this is uh, not possible, but we all know that nothing is impossible, but uh, there is a cost attached to it. WhatsApp's contention was linked to the privacy issues and the reason why we at FDPPA have to also take note of this, which actually comes under the information technology related um, uh, discussions, uh, cyber crime and cyber security issues, but um, it is also related to privacy because um, one of the contentions, WhatsApp kind of people, and now of course the signal and uh, maybe telegram will all rise is, that they would like to provide a messaging service on an end-to-end -end encryption basis. What the government has been telling is that you have your end-to-end -end encryption as far as the message is concerned, but when it comes to uh, the uh, uh, header information, which contains the um, origin or uh, who was the first originator and how was it forwarded from person to person, that information is what the government says that where there is an investigation of a criminal um, process, I mean, a case or something like that, there should be an opportunity for uh, the government of India to um, ask for that information and uh, intermediaries like WhatsApp should uh, actually cooperate. This was the uh, reason why the draft gu guidelines were uh, brought in uh, the December 2018, but it um, was uh, vehemently opposed. And then of course, uh, with the change of the parliament, the public comments were collected and then uh, we had almost forgotten that. But basically what had happened was the government had developed a cold feet because of the opposition um, to the uh, amendments which were made. So it did come as a slight surprise when suddenly the press conference was announced and one um, very unique thing about this press conference was that uh, for the first time, I think two ministers sat together and uh, gave a particular notification, which was jointly 
applicable to both the Ministry of uh, Information and Broadcasting and Information Technology. It was as if each was providing strength to the other because uh, singly uh, they were uh, not able to take on the uh, media backlash. That is how even in an earlier situation when uh, even a small uh, change was proposed by Smriti uh, Rani, when she was INB minister, suddenly there was so much of opposition that the government actually withdrew the notification. So it was uh, a situation where two ministers got together and then came up with this uh, joint uh, uh, notification. And it uh, addressed two aspects simultaneously. One was what was generally called the intermediary guidelines even in the earlier notification with whatever modifications were there consequent to this uh, recent Twitter uh, related uh, differences. Then there was also this digital media regulation uh, which has, has actually attracted a lot more opposition from the media. Obviously media wants absolute freedom. Um, when you say absolute freedom, they want freedom even to uh, spread anarchy. They say that that is the freedom of speech. In fact, uh, even some of the courts like uh, the court which actually heard the, the um, Disha Ravi's uh, bail case, they were also uh, uh, coming to a conclusion that uh, since anarchy, sedition and other things are not that important. Okay, so there is generally the uh, way uh, the Indian democracy functions. We always want our uh, policemen to have uh, batons and fight against AK-47. Same way we want government also not to have any regulations, but to stop terrorism and uh, anarchy. But anyway, that is how we need to function. So this particular um, notification took the responsibility to address the situation which came after January 26th Red Fort attack, which was actually prompted by this uh, Twitter storm and other planning and execution which was done. And I have called this sometimes as information terrorism. Okay, so we have heard of information war when a state um, attacks another uh, uh, nation state, like perhaps what people are talking of today, that China attacked Indian power grid a couple of uh, days back. But this what we are seeing uh, in this um, farmer's agitation and other things is that there is an information uh, terrorism where uh, a set of uh, non-state actors are spreading messages and using that to actually instigate physical action like uh, storming the red fort or whatever uh, is that. So this is what prompted the government to immediately start uh, working on something. And um, what we have now is uh, here. Now, one of the things which we must remember is there is a notification, no doubt, people are um, having their own uh, reservations, but what would be the consequence of non-observance? This is something which uh, some people don't understand. Uh, without understanding uh, the impact of that, they make uh, loose comments. But actually, Section 79 only says that in organization which is called an intermediary will not get protection or the safe harbor protection in certain cases. This is not a penal section by itself. That is, there is no penalty for violating section 79. The penalty comes indirectly because normally whenever a contravention of the act takes place by an intermediary, actually the contravention would have happened because of some information or data, which actually is a third party data which the intermediary might have hosted or transmitted. So it will be automatically a prima facie situation where the intermediary would be a, a looked at as an abater to the crime because without the aid of the intermediary, the perpetrator would not be able to commit the crime. So once the crime has been committed, there will be several conspirators plus the 
conspiracy was perhaps hatched and executed on the platform. Therefore, intermediary comes into the uh, lawful, uh, uh, you can say, questioning. Now, to prevent business entities who are innocent, who are just running the business of information transmission, and who have not abated or who don't have any malicious intention uh, from being held liable, this section 79 is there, which says uh, that if you take certain uh, due diligence measures, then uh, you will not be held liable. Okay, so that is section 79. Now, section 79, of course, is applicable only to intermediaries, not to others. And an intermediary is defined in the Information Technology Act as somebody whose function is limited to providing access to the communication system where information is passing through. And one of the important criteria is that the platform should not initiate transmission on its own. It should not select to whom the information has to be uh, dis uh, distributed, and it should not modify the contents of the transmission. If these conditions are not fulfilled, the organization ceases to be called an intermediary, which means that it ceases to get protection under this section 79. So if such an organization observes due diligence, then it will get the protection. Now, since these uh, I mean, descriptions are little generic, there was a uh, uh, sort of a confusion with many companies saying that uh, if we just handle the information on a membership basis, we create a member and then we say members only have to use the service, something like that, will it also be considered as initiating the transmission, selecting the receiver, etc.? Fortunately, in this current notification, the uh, particular uh, doubts have been uh, uh, clear. And now it uh, clearly says that uh, certain uh, technical uh, handling of information will not be uh, used to, to actually consider an organization as not an intermediary. But otherwise, uh, any intermediary which has not uh, conspired or abetted and uh, which after coming to know that an offense is being committed promptly takes action to remove that content, such organizations would be given this protection under Section 79. Why I am saying this is even the law enforcement and the lawyer judiciary are not fully conversant with Section 79. In fact, after this 25th February, on 1st March, which is within this three, four uh, days, there was a notice issued in uh, Manipur by the district magistrate of uh, Impal, where he has issued a notice to a uh, particular uh, news um, uh, paper, which says something like this, okay? I just want you to see that few lines which are there, which shows how our lawyer judiciary is completely ignorant of what is section 79. See, this notice says, whereas, uh, it has come to the notice that this uh, particular Facebook page of uh, this particular uh, organization um, is a news and current affairs uh, in, I mean, page. That is fine. And secondly, whereas the ministry has given this notification, these are the two things they have mentioned. Whereas this company is having a Facebook page, whereas the government has given this particular thing, I hereby direct that you should furnish all relevant documents showing that you ensure compliance of the provisions of this. This particular notification or section 79 does not envisage a sort of a notice which has been sent by this DM to show compliance. Section 79 only says that if you don't want to be compliant, don't be compliant. But when there is a particular offense which is attributed to the company, when you come back to the court and say, I'm an intermediary, you don't hold me responsible, at that time, we will not give you the uh, protection. That is all the uh, Section 79 says, which has not been understood by this DM. Fortunately, this 
was immediately revoked. Maybe somebody told uh, the DM. So, but that is how people actually get a bad impression about the law. We all know that Section 66A was scrapped by Supreme Court because the constables of a lower police station in Palgar decided to file a case against the two Palgar girls quoting Section 66A when it was not applicable to that particular case. Nobody questioned the constables why they uh, took that Section 66A there. Instead of that, they went on saying that Section 66A is bad and therefore uh, between the, with the High Court, Supreme Court, everybody said that Section 66A has to be uh, scrapped. A similar situation would come if this uh, impal uh, DM's uh, notice is taken into account. Definitely there will be people who will be telling that uh, this notification is bad, therefore it should be scrapped or something like that. I would like that mis uh, misunderstanding to be cleared first. Now, having stated this, the essence of due diligence, as we already know, is very simple and clear. One is an intermediary should have a privacy policy which is displayed, terms and conditions should be displayed. Okay. Then, of course, most of the people don't do that. That is a different uh, situation. I mean, uh, I think this is the minimum required for somebody maintaining a website with an information content uh, exposed to the uh, public. Then, these policies have to be, in a way, renewed every year in the sense that you should ask that member or somebody that, uh, okay, this is uh, our current policy. You might have forgotten what was our policy one year back. So this is my current policy. We hope you have taken note of it. So once in a year, a communication has to go from the intermediary to the subject to say or uh, remind him that this is our policy and terms. The other most important aspect of uh, this whole uh, notification is the importance given to the grievance redressal mechanism. In fact, that is another reason why I wanted FDPPA to take note of this, because we are trying to get into the grievance redressal mechanism system, at least for the data related uh, disputes. And um, therefore, uh, we, I thought that it is, uh, good for us to have a discussion. Now, under the grievance redressal mechanism, an intermediary has to initiate action within 24 hours and resolution has to be there within 15 days. Otherwise, they are in default so that the matter may be taken to the next uh, level. Now, where a court asks for a content to be removed, there is no option for the organization but to remove it immediately. And similarly, when an appropriate authority like an authority under Section 69A issues a proper notice, then also the intermediary has to uh, comply with it. it. These things have to be done as soon as possible, but not beyond a uh, 36 hours uh, deadline. Okay, But where content is removed, the evidence has to be retained for 180 days. This evidence is not only to be retained when content is removed, even in the case of registration information, if somebody becomes a member today and uh, tomorrow he sends some information, I mean, uh, tweets, and day after tomorrow he closes his account. That information about the registration and other things also has to be maintained for 180 days, which is an evidence to enable uh, legal action or uh, law enforcement action. The other important aspect which was there in the 2018 version and later on it came into the PDP bill 2019 and has been reiterated now is to enable identification of the person who is the member of a intermediary system okay like a Twitter uh, something like that today the Twitter has got the uh, discretion to put the verification tag, blue tick or whatever is that. And they have their own mechanism, which is uh, not always considered fair, uh, because uh, there are many fake accounts which carry uh, verified tag. How they could get it, we do not know. So obviously there is a uh, problem in whatever system they are uh, having. What the government of India has now stated is, if a person 
voluntarily is willing to identify himself either by his mobile number or anything else then the platform should make an arrangement to see that this verification is displayed so this verification that blue tick now comes into the uh, control of the uh, user of course if we have a twitter wants to continue the blue tick you may have to have a green tick or something else to say that this was self verified by the user other one was verified by the uh, twitter so in due course uh, the credibility of twitter versus self uh, identification verification would determine whether people will accept the uh, postings made by the verified handle as uh, true or realistic uh, or whether they will ignore it uh, if there is something which is uh, appearing to be a fake information so this enabling voluntary verification of identity is one of the things which technically the social media platforms will have to uh, do the other one is the enabling of the identification of the originator of a message and if a message has originated from abroad what the government wants now is the first originator in india is the person who who may have to be revealed to the government or a law enforcement agency when it is required for uh, enabling this uh, we have to see what uh, people like whatsapp will do whether they will uh, give uh, the some kind of a tag to the first creation of a message and then whenever it moves and gets forwarded uh there has to be a meta tag which if required should be able to be extracted to find out who was the originator of the uh, particular message considering the international jurisdiction issue the government has stated that uh, the law enforcement power to ask for this information is restricted to the originator in india okay other than this an intermediary should provide physical address which is also part of the disclosure then um, if there is a law enforcement re request for investigation which is different from the court order for withdrawal of a uh, content okay when there is a request from law enforcement there should be cooperation within 72 hours otherwise it will be a violation see if you look at section 69 or 69a or 69b it says that if an organization does not cooperate with the agency which seeks information for example 69 is for blocking or uh, uh, interception 69a is for blocking etc if the home ministry sends out a request and if a company does not uh, provide assistance there is a criminal uh, possible punishment of 3 uh, years to 7 years etc whereas in the section 79 when it says provide information to law enforcement within 72 hours if it is not possible for this information to be given then if they want to invoke crpc for non cooperation that's a different thing but this section itself doesn't go beyond saying that you will therefore lose your protection under section 79 that is all so there is no need to unnecessarily criticize this section 79 because section 79 is only that in certain instances the protective cover will not be available to get the protective cover you have to fall into a discipline that is all it says in case there is no uh, let us say offense which has been committed then the question of whether you should you need a safe harbor or not itself will not arise so only people who want to Uh, post certain uh, controversial messages and still they don't want to be questioned by the courts or the government they are the only kind of media which will have to um, worry about this uh, section uh, 79 there is a mention of uh, this uh, technical measures uh, to be installed um, for identifying nudity child abuse etc Uh, but of course uh, as of now it doesn't seem to be mandatory but they have said that efforts have to be made for this uh, we know that uh, at least uh, in uh, usa and other places there are artificial intelligence algorithms which try to identify this so perhaps the government feels that uh, same thing should be brought in to india 
also okay now this is about the uh, intermediary uh, i mean uh, due diligence we will get into the questioning after i complete uh, some aspects of digital media regulation because this is something which uh, is uh, of interest to a lot of uh, media people so digital media regulation is being will be managed by the inb ministry not by uh, ministry of information technology and um, it is will be in addition to whatever is there in section 69a which says uh, that uh, the ministry of home uh, will be able to issue directions for blocking of certain certain information and if it is not done there is a punishment etc so that will remain in, including uh, whatever is there in section 69a which is a punitive section this digital media regulation will be going with the intermediary regulation because every digital media is also an intermediary but this specific set of things which are there in this notification will apply to publishers of news and current affairs content second publishers of online curated content okay and that too only when the publisher operates in the territory of india or the publisher conducts systematic business activity of making news available in uh, india okay so this is not going to be universally applied to everybody it is will be applied only to the publishers of news and current affairs and online curated content that will apply to somebody like the youtube channels because there is an aggregation of uh, a certain published content and uh, that platform uh, will contribute to the dispersion of uh, the message including your ott platform like your netflix or z news or kind of a thing they all come under this regulation other smaller uh, entities uh, may not have much to worry about now what this regulation says is that just as we have a code of ethics for print media code of ethics for tv media there will be a code of ethics for digital media okay and what we mean by digital media is somebody who is providing the news uh, content many of them are now today uh, there as youtube channels for example shekhar gupta has got his channel in karnataka also we have got a number of such uh, channels so they try to uh, even many freelance journalists have started their own um, uh, you can say channels so code of ethics um, is something which uh, experienced journalists would actually welcome they don't they have got nothing against code of ethics now implementation of this has been put in three different levels one is every organization which is a publisher or a curated uh, content publisher they should have a self regulation that is uh, they themselves should have their policy like the intermediary you should have a policy you should display that policy you should display your address etc etc that is self regulation then there will be yes there is a suggestion that the media digital media people should develop self regulating bodies outside the government that is there could be associations or something like that they have some kind of uh, a regulation uh, of their members so that if self regulation fails then they will come into uh, being uh, a, 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 an authority which will try to resolve the disputes and over and above this there is the third level which is the government which is the oversight mechanism so this three level um, media regulation is what is being suggested again this is not much different from the intermediary as far as self regulation is concerned there is a need to have a grievance redressal mechanism there is a need to appoint a grievance officer but he should be based in india then contact details should be made available then this grievance officer should be able to uh, resolve the grievances within 15 days and since every such organization should also be a member of the self regulating body then in case certain grievances cannot be resolved by the organization it may go as an a 
kind of an elevated uh, compliant to the self regulatory body remember again self regulatory body doesn't have a punitive power it is not like an appellate tribunal um, and if there is a monetary claim to be made the claim has to be made under the section 46 of information technology act to the adjudicator and the appellate tribunal so this is for a different uh, purpose this is more like the censor board in the case of films and other things okay so this grievance officer is the person responsible for implementation of the code of ethics the other important aspect of regulation is that when curated content that is this videos and other things are published the government wants certain classification to be made uh, and displayed for example whether some content is good for being viewed by children or it should be considered as adult content and in between they have tried to make a distinction between 7 uh, uh, years 13 years 16 years and of course 18 years and above and uh, this five categories they have made and they want the content to be classified as uh, u rating or a rating or in between this uh, 13 plus 7 plus or 16 plus uh, rating by bringing in this regulation the government has also simultaneously said that you have to register with the ministry of information technology otherwise you cannot uh, perhaps implement it therefore there is a provision for furnishing information which essentially boils down to a very digital media which particularly comes under the category of significant uh, social media intermediary um, or uh, the publisher of news and current affairs for which also they may introduce certain volume criteria and other things or they may directly um, notify certain uh, organizations only such organizations need to get themselves registered if they register they and they are maintaining a grievance redressal mechanism they are supposed to publish monthly reports of what grievances they received how they handled it and so on so this is the kind of furnishing of information this particular uh, 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 i mean notification is trying to uh, address okay i think some of these things are already being done by google and others on request they are telling what how many uh, queries they received and how they handled same thing is being made applicable to everybody else this second level self regulatory body is of interest to us because this is an institutional level support which has to be given to the smaller self uh, you can say developed uh, media uh, entrepreneurs and uh, an association has to be formed and uh, i have been uh, trying to suggest to some media people in bangalore that they should set up their own association here and uh, if uh, uh, because the grievance redressal is also going to be part of this uh, self regulatory bodies uh, functions maybe they can make use of uh, uh, our uh, dd mac to actually resolve the uh, disputes that is our interest in trying to help people in develop this kind of a society of uh, journalists now of course the section says that uh, this particular rule says that it may be headed by a retired judge of supreme court or high court like the press council but it also says that it can also be headed by an independent eminent person from the field of media broadcasting entertainment child rights human rights etc which means that this self regulating body need not have a supreme court judge or a high court judge others also can be there as head of this and of course it will be a body of 1 plus 6 persons and uh, it has to get itself registered with the ministry for which we are awaiting the uh, details of what uh, needs to be done generally the functions is basically to oversee the functions of the digital uh, media and uh, even uh, whenever a complaint is not being resolved by the level 1 it will come to this uh, uh self regulatory body at uh, level 2 that is basically the functionalities of uh, this and uh, the code of ethics itself is nothing different from the journalistic uh, code which is there uh, in the press council of india program code so i am sure that uh, the media should not have too much of a concern about the code of ethics in fact all serious journalists would be happy to have this code of ethics so that the 
digital yellow journalism doesn't uh, become uh, more powerful okay and uh, even when the government is talking of uh, restrictions most of the restrictions they have very much uh, they have specified that this uh, this should be applied where there is an uh, adverse effect on sovereignty and integrity of india etc which are all the exemptions which are there under article 192 okay so if this particular uh, notification is challenged in supreme court the government uh, perhaps will be defending that whatever controls it is trying to address is not anti constitutional it is already there okay so content classification i said you rating 7 plus rating 13 plus rating 16 plus rating technically what will be the issue for the media would be to introduce the technical measure of uh, age verification and uh, tagging it so probably that is what uh, may increase their cost a little but guidelines have been given for how to classify basically these are all things which are there for films and other things in censor board same thing will be there and uh, it will the, the classification will have to be uh, properly uh, displayed so essentially this is the digital media regulation and beyond this of course the government should have always the right and that is the oversight mechanism it is important to note that in the oversight mechanism the government says that they will publish a charter they will have an interdepartmental committee and actually they will appoint or designate a person called an authorized officer who will be the person who will be providing the guidance to the whole digital media this authorized officer will work in the ministry of information and broadcasting not information and technology so this is a continuation of whatever regulatory functions the inb ministry is doing for print and uh, tv media it is being extended uh, here because internet also comes under in, uh, the ministry of information technology act there is a overlapping of that and this committee again can only issue some warnings uh, admonish or something like that or make uh, suggestions to change uh, uh, ratings uh, if necessary they can invoke section 69a powers to ask for deletion so the entire mechanism is not like an over enthusiastic censorship of the media but introducing a regulatory measure which um, ultimately is within the powers which are already available under section 69 uh, a of information technology act instead of blanket uh, issuing uh, let us say blocking orders uh, now at least there is a certain due process uh, for that and even when such um uh, orders are issued it will be subject to the concurrence of the secretary of the inb ministry and a review committee which uh, will review it once in a uh, uh, minimum of uh, uh, two months so which is also already available in our law in the indian telegraph rules so i think the government has done enough homework to actually strengthen the i mean uh, notification from legal uh, Uh, standpoint so that it cannot be challenged uh, in the court of law so at uh, my end and at our uh, uh, organizations and like our uh, fdppi uh, of course at navi.org i have said we will start uh, yes advise i mean service where we will provide digital media compliance guidance service uh, just to help uh, the smaller of the digital media so of course larger di digital medias including ott platforms will have to go for a compliance advisory services which will be perhaps like another you can say opportunity to develop compliance uh, related uh, service okay uh, but uh, smaller companies they would uh, not know what to do so i thought uh, that uh, i will try to provide a, a digital uh, media compliance guidance center which will be a free service which will give to most of the uh, media okay uh, this is similar to the type of consultancy i used to run in the initial days in cyber crimes people used to ask for information um, and we used to give it free only now after several years some of them have become um, you can say paid services and uh, uh, other lawyers uh, will actually take uh, care of that so similarly here 
the media will require initially a sort of uh, education and clarification, which I am trying to give that maybe DD Mac under FDPPI will perhaps provide the um, services if required for mediation or uh, any other uh, uh, grievance redressal uh, uh, services. So this is in general what this particular uh, notification means and um, if there are any questions this is the time we can spend on discussions okay so let us have some questions and we will together try to address uh, the questions okay now is that yeah now that newspapers what we get into 24 pages 30 pages mm. also be published in the digital mode yeah so yeah. what is the journalistic content developed in that newspaper, which is coming the digital mode, will also get affected by this regulation, sir? Yeah, that, that will be another channel. Okay. But obviously, the code of ethics is already applicable to them in the um, print media. So this hmm. is not going to be something which is difficult for them to handle. Okay. But if they are providing, uh, let us say, digital only publication, are making changes from the print media to this. See, why this has become necessary is the normal print media has got a sort of a oversight mechanism within the uh, publication. Like there is a reporter who actually gives his uh, uh, story to a particular uh, edit sub-editor, sub-editor to editor. So there was some kind of a oversight mechanism. When this digital media came up, particularly when this TV media, when they put breaking news, what they say is the time difference between the time when actually the news enters the studio and the time it goes on to the screen is less than 15 seconds. There is nobody who is seeing anything. They just put the scroll there and say breaking news. Because of that only, there is an issue there. Similarly, in Twitter and other things, uh, you see this is a uh, uh, user-controlled media, so there is no second level of... Uh, control and that is why we have most of these problems and there is a need for digital media regulation otherwise it would not be necessary actually if there is at least one layer of uh, supervision if i produce a content and xyz is uh, reviewing it and then it is going online that will uh, reduce the possibility of my writing something uh, which is perhaps defamatory or something like that no so that is the need for this digital media regulation is higher than the print media regulation, which of course is already there anyway. Yeah. yeah. Navi sir, so just uh, continuing with the discussion which we had in the beginning, I think Ravi ji has also put a similar question. He's talking of Zoom Teams and Google Meet. So you know, what are your thoughts on you know the, their deletion of the exception? Because by virtue of those, like my understanding is by virtue of the exceptions being deleted, so while all, all these companies, if they are you know, running an entity which is solely performing that particular task, they would fall into the bucket of being a social media intermediary. And obviously they will have to do some amount of compliance, which we talked of as due diligence, which would definitely involve an add-on cost. So due diligence applies to social media intermediary when the information is actually placed before the public. Now, for example, if you in your teams, uh, you are actually exchanging information within the company that is not going to be affected no, uh, i agree with, i agree with you navi sir that is how it was in the initial uh, draft now if you see the uh, definition which they have put of social media intermediary where they removed the exception it basically says social media intermediary means an intermediary which primarily or solely enables online interaction between two or more users so two or more is a word so two also is uh, fine and allows them to create, upload, share, disseminate, modify, or access information. Now here, I will not look into any other word. I will just look into one word called share. So if two or more users can share information using the services, it will be social media interview. So when you do a normal presentation like we are doing now in Zoom also, you are sharing information and we are watching, even if it is between you and me. Oh. Suppose so that, this Suppose this presentation you know, was uh, uh, like uh, you are... Uh, Said Disharavi's presentation or something like that, then uh, no, 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 we are not talking of you know what is good or bad. Let us presume that uh, some people will do good, some people will do bad. But the, as far as their company is concerned, now because they fall into that bucket, they will have to you know uh, 
install all those checks and balances in place, which would be an add-on cost, just because they removed that exception. Because the earlier exception was, it is not applicable for business transactions. So let me let me let me add here, Navi, that, uh, that you know any any company which is conducting an event, uh, it is conducting an online event, it is streaming uh, the event publicly to you know any number of participants, uh, and it is pub and it is publicly available. So will that company be liable to record? Or the entire event and any conversation that happens, any video conversation that happens during that event, and won't this increase uh, the cost of compliance significantly? Now, cost of compliance will be there. Say, every compliance adds cost. There is no doubt about it. You are talking of a uh, uh, online event which is public. I mean, given, I mean, uh, where access is available to the public. So. There has to be due diligence uh, in the sense that uh, in the form of a discussion, actually, it may not go overboard and um, the discussion should not turn into some uh, anti-national activities. So due diligence is required, which means that maybe we may have to give uh, like uh, these uh, rules and regulations, privacy policy instructions to the speakers and others. Maybe perhaps that is one compliance requirement which may, which we may have to do. Saying that uh, this plat in this platform, you when you share your views, uh, please remember that it should be subject to the uh, ten different things in the guideline. It is that ten things not to be done, uh, like in the normal intermediary things that uh, you should not use a content which is not belonging to you. You should not have a talk of other various things. The ten different points. Same thing perhaps should be given as a code of uh, conduct for speakers. Uh, when I am trying to organize, for example, a yeah, uh, public platform. Okay, so that maybe that is what uh, will be required. Then if you have provided that, and suppose some discussion is going in a tangent into a different direction, it happens, uh, let us say, then as an administrator or a moderator, um, then perhaps you have to... Uh, cut the discussion. If it, uh, for example, in a news, uh, in a TV media, if uh, say the debate is going on in Arnab Goswami's channel and suddenly things go out of hand, the anchor is supposed to actually stop the discussion or at least mute the person kind of a thing. Similar things may have to be done, which means that in such events, the event organizer may have to organize a kind of oversight mechanism. Um, I hope it will not happen in our professional things that will not happen. We will have differences of opinion, but it will not be uh, getting into political and other things. But if the discussion is, uh, say, JNU kind of discussion, definitely it is possible that it may get out of control. And the person who is organizing should have the control to uh, mute a particular person and perhaps uh, take him out of the discussion. That kind of uh, due diligence may be required. Okay, that is oh, my view. I am also reacting yes. uh, ju just based on uh, uh, the thoughts which is which are coming up. Okay, understand, sir. Understand, yeah. sir. So my my just one follow up question on that was: Will the company be liable to reproduce the uh, the uh, any 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 video content within thirty six hours? Say, hey, yeah. If you look at the principle which has been used in the messaging services, the government says you give me the details of the origin. Okay content uh, is, is still uh, covered by the confidentiality. So the first question the person, uh, government may ask is, who was that speaker? What is his email address? Okay, that much I think an uh, organizer should always be able to provide, okay? You cannot say that somebody stood up and spoke in the audience, I don't know who is that person, okay? So identity of the persons who are contributing uh, the content must be available. So which means that uh, if you are having a Zoom, we are having at least the names of people who are uh, there and uh, whether we allow them to rename them or that kind of a thing is what we need to look uh, for. Or we may have to get into a, in a controversial uh, discussion. We may have to uh, get people only on board uh, with uh, the prayer, prayer registration so that at least we will know one uh, email address, whether it is fake or real, at least there will be an email address, and that is what is expected as uh, for the organizer. Okay. Navi so, so Navi sir, so one thing we agree is you know cost of compliance definitely mm -hmm. it's a tick mark. 
Where will go? Where will it go? It will go to consultants. Part of it will go come to consultants, <laughs> and part of them will have to be passed on to the consumers. <laughs> So there will be tools. There will be uh, various, um, I mean, IT tools uh, to handle it automatically. Is it Correct. compliance cost? There is no doubt about it. Every compliance GDPR has increased the cost. GDPR will increase the cost. Now the question is, without this regulation, will there be a lessage fair kind of uh, situation? Whether it is desirable, <clears throat> that is all. See, there was a time when the citizen activities were distinct from netizen activities. Okay, so uh, in initial internet days, you showed whatever you want in the internet, it would not affect the physical world. But now the two are very closely integrated. So uh, what happens in Twitter will create, a, for example, a lynching in the physical space. So because of that, you cannot ignore it. Okay, if you are a regulator, you will say that I can't ignore it because there is positive evidence to say that the information which is uh, distributed on the digital media has an impact on the physical activity, like organizing people for demonstration and the demonstration becomes violent. All these things will happen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Recently, uh, probably you might observe it. There is a Kelly serial in the Prime uh, Amazon Prime standout. On that, after the transmission of that uh, serial, there was a huge kind in the social media about the degrading Shiva, Shiva or Shiva in some content of the serial. So subsequently, Amazon and the producers, directors, everybody extended the apology to the public. Yeah, see. Defamation happens, and many times, uh, uh, say, in fact, last 15 days, I have been trying to actually file some defamation against one uh, so-called YouTube channel uh, or mm -hmm. a website. Uh, in the entire website, there is no address. There is no email address of the content writer. He has put up a defamatory article, but nobody can file a, a complaint. Mm -hmm. uh, then whereas you go, you go to the... Uh, who is address of the particular website. And GoDaddy mm. says, oh, it is privacy protected. You come with a court order, and then I will tell you who is the owner of the website. Now, such kind of, uh, say, hiding of identities um, is what is making things more difficult because the person who has been affected doesn't have a proper legal remedy uh, because of what we call as privacy and other things. In fact, this who is privacy in the in respect of a digital media, it doesn't come under our personal privacy. See, we are talking of a media company and uh, I want to know what is the physical address of that media company so that I can send a notice. That is not available. The website is registered in the name of the company and GoDaddy says that that is privacy protected. I am, I am sure that that doesn't come under either GDPR or anything like that. It is not a personal ID. So these are the things which this um, notification has tried to address, saying that it is mandatory that you should put in uh, the contact details. Okay. Uh, Navi sir, this is Saurabh here. Uh, so in the case of defamatory, obscene and pornographic, that the user got the uh, right to ask uh, this social media site to delete something in this uh, notification? Uh, uh, say if it is defamatory and if he is the victim, he has got the definitely right uh, right to raise an objection, but he cannot actually force the intermediary to uh, delete. That has to come through the order of a appropriate uh, either a court or uh, an, um, uh, authority. But where in the case of nudity and uh, say pornography, it is apparent that the information is. Uh, uh, considered obscene, emergent action is expected out of the media to remove it and then give a notice. Of course, this uh, notification says that before uh, taking down the content, you have to actually give a notice to the content owner and saying that I have received an objection, I'm going to uh, remove that. And if he has got uh, an objection, that person has to go to the court and ask for a stay or something like that. So either the organization like uh, Twitter or social media with their own internal uh, mechanism 
should determine whether emergent action is required or not. But if an order comes from the court, they can't sit in judgment and say that I will not agree with the court kind of a thing. But if a request comes from an individual, they have a reason to perhaps sit in judgment of that and tell the person who is complaining, please go to the court and then uh, come with an order. Or at least file a case with the police and come with a CRPC notice. And if the management decides that no, no, prima facie, what this person is ask, uh, saying is correct, then they have to send a notice to the content owner and say that I am going to delete this within 24 hours. If you have got an objection, please let me know. If you want, you go to the court and bring a stay. So he has to act as a person who has to uh, intermediate between the two parties without taking any specific stand, without a logical reason. Now, with the constitution of the self-regulatory bodies, it is possible for this person to immediately escalate it to this self-regulatory body without waiting for courts and other things, because it's an association kind of a thing, so he has got more access, like your film uh, chamber or something like that. If there's the uh, uh, controversy about a film, uh, they immediately go to the film chamber and uh, some uh, somebody in the film chamber will take a, a view on that. Like that, this locally available uh, level two self-regulatory bodies will be more easily accessible to the intermediary. I'm talking of the content uh, related thing, the digital media, so that if there is a difficulty in uh, deciding who is correct, the, uh, either the person who is asking for the content to be removed is correct, or the person who says it has to be there is correct, because one is freedom of speech, another is a uh, right not to be defamed. Okay, the, there is a need to balance the two. And since the content owner is not going to take a judicial stand, he can immediately escalate it to the self-regulating body and uh, he can actually absolve himself of the responsibility. That is due diligence. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So now, sir, uh, I've yeah. seen uh, this is not pertaining to the uh, the media thing. So thus, uh, the some of the online marketing forms comes online and they got the uh, the tie up with the payment gateways. So they are online for maybe few weeks, and this is fully advertised in uh, right. Facebook, and yeah. they disappear. Yeah, they disappear. This is happening now very frequently. Yeah. It, how is this addressed now? Now, one of these uh, conditions which says 180 days, the information has to be kept by the platform. Now, who is that platform? I can say that that registrar, uh, the hosting company can be the platform. Okay. okay. Mm. So, suppose uh, the um, I mean, website has been hosted with GoDaddy. Then mm. GoDaddy has to uh, keep that information for 180 days. Mm. So, it is a question of preservation of evidence in the cases which you are mentioning. Even phishing sites are there only for a few hours. Mm. After a few hours, it will go. Now, suppose I want to know who registered that phishing site, from which IP address he registered that what IP address. Whatever the payment gateway, they are also equally responsible. Yeah. They are intermediaries. Payment gateways are also intermediaries. So they are also supposed to retain the evidence. Okay, particularly if the fraud is flagged. The moment a fraud is flagged and information is sent to all the people who are likely to have evidence of a particular cognizable offense, they have to treat it as evidence and maintain it. Otherwise, they will be committing an offense under Section 204 of IPC, as well as Section 65 of Information Technology Act for deleting an information which ought to have been kept for a period of time under law. So that applies to the payment gateway also. They have to have a system whereby, uh, see, it's all financial information. You cannot overnight delete it, uh, okay? Because money laundering may be uh, taking place through the payment gateway. So I think they have got a legitimate interest not to delete the information instantly, even when the person deletes his account. You have to maintain it for a reasonable period of time, like your CCTV footage. Why do we say CCTV footage has to be kept at least for 90 days or 180 days? Because we don't know whether an offense has been committed and it has been captured by the CCTV. So instead of simply deleting it, it is better to keep it for a cooling period. And what is a reasonable cooling period? We can discuss uh, differently for different situations, but it should be kept for some time. 
and if a crime has been potential crime has been reported then the cctv footage has to be uh, taken as a potential evidence of a cognizable offense then it cannot be deleted at all even after 90 days similar situation will be there for this payment gateway all payment systems you have to keep the log records for a certain period of time okay a reasonable period of time even when the purpose is over but uh, financial things for income tax purpose we have to keep it for seven years no i don't think you can delete it immediately if any financial transaction has taken place income has been generated for the payment gateway company then at least for our tax purposes you should be able to say that so and so did this transaction and 